Hi, everyone. Michael Britt here. Now, I'm very proud that the Psych Files podcast has been so successful. Recently, it passed the 20 million download mark. And a lot of that success is due to my episodes on how you can use proven memory strategies to remember just about anything, from memorizing terms for a test to remembering people's names at a party or a meeting, or even memorizing speeches. It's amazing how useful these strategies are. So, I put all of these episodes into one audio course. In the most popular of these episodes, I talk about how to use images of hippos and llamas to improve your memory. So naturally, the course is called Hippos, Aliens, and Llamas. Quickly master the tricks to a great memory. And I think you'll really enjoy the course, and it's available now on avid.fm. That's A-V-I-D dot F-M. So find out what llamas can do for your memory by going to avid.fm slash memorymaster. All one word. I think you're really going to enjoy the course, and I know you'll find lots of uses for these strategies in your own life. So that's avid.fm slash memorymaster. You're going to get a lot out of it. avid.fm slash memorymaster. Hello, everybody, and welcome to episode 303 of the Psych Files. Michael Britt here, and this is actually part two of an episode, a continuation of episode 302, which was about really a summary of some of the, some of what we know about why people become involved in violent extremist groups and what can we do about it. How do they become radicalized, and then what can we do to de-radicalize them? Then in touch with one of the authors, does some of this theory about why young people especially become involved in violent extremism, does any of this apply to young people who carry out violent acts in schools? And the answer is yes, it does. Some of the elements in this model, which I'll review just briefly in a second, definitely do play a part in what we're seeing, especially, of course, in the United States, uh, with young people going into schools and killing people. So the research I'm drawing from is called uh, the first one, the primary one, The Making of Violent Extremists. And there are a lot of researchers involved in this. And the second one is called The Road to Extremism, Field and Experimental Evidence that Significance Loss-Induced Need for Closure Fosters Radicalization. They're, they're lengthy articles. And if you are interested in learning more about why not only people join extremist groups, why uh, young people get involved in school violence, I think you're going to find a lot in these articles. So a serious and important topic for sure. So let's dig into this theory. It's called Significance Quest Theory. And again, just some of the authors, because they really have developed this theory extensively. Very impressive. Lead author is Ari Kruglansky, Katarzyna Jasko, David Weber, Marina Chernikova, and Erica Molinario. A few of them from the University of Maryland. David is from the Virginia Commonwealth University. And Katarzyna, honestly, I don't know how to pronounce the name of that university. As I say, come to the website and check out and the citations for these articles. A couple other authors, got to mention them from the other uh, article I've been reading, The Road to Extremism, would be uh, Maxim Babush, Noah Shori Eyal, Anna Nguyenhus, Malkanthi Hetiarchi, Jocelyn Belanger, Manuel Moyano, Umberto Truillo, Rohan Gunaratna, and Michelle Gelfand. Now, what's interesting about all these authors... It's not just um, a couple of universities, as I mentioned previously. We also have the University of Chicago, Interdisciplinary Center in Israel, University of Pittsburgh, New York University, Makara University, that's in Sydney, Australia, Universidad de, I hope I pronounced this right, Cordoba, Universidad de Granada, a university in Singapore. Quite an impressive list of researchers. All right. So what are the roots of extremism? And what can be done about it? There's really three key ingredients. First, there has to be a triggering event, something that happens to an individual that induces great humiliation, shame, or dishonor. That event leads to a felt loss of significance. All of us want to feel good about ourselves, right? We, it's the old self-esteem bias. 
right? We like to attribute the good things to ourselves and the bad things to other people. We all do that. But after these moments of extreme humiliation or shame, there's such a loss in one's sense of self, one's feelings that one even matters, even matters to be alive. So that's what they call a felt loss of significance. And when that happens, you can understand naturally, there's, there's what they call, they call it a motivational imbalance. Basically, there's a desire to restore our sense of importance in this world. That doesn't have to be necessarily a personal shame. It could be the realization that one's group, one's social identity, one's religion has been attacked. So that leads to the loss of significance and the need, what they refer to as the need for closure. So what I've got to do now is find a way to get back my important, my sense of importance. And I'm going to look for, most likely, very, as they say, clear-cut unambiguous ways to do that. Again, another quote, a need for a sense of certainty and structure. Now, who is particularly vulnerable to feeling such a sense of awfulness? Some of the ones that they identify are, and I'll just, I'll refer to some of them, uh, individuals who are rejection sensitive, those who are status conscious, achievement oriented, those who are very easily persuaded, those who are eager to conform. And from a developmental psychology perspective, we're, we're probably talking about individuals that Eric Erickson would classify in his developmental system as being people who are in the identity versus role confusion stage, which is later adolescence. And as we talked about, adolescence really should extend into the early 20s because that's the length of time that, that we are struggling with our sense of who the heck are we. Also, another factor that they identify is that individuals who, and I'll and use their words, quote, come from an honor culture. I think I may have mentioned this in the previous episode. So especially where honor is important, feelings such as humiliation and shame are particularly painful. Okay, so you've got that pain. You've got a need for closure. There's two other ingredients to their model, narrative and network. And a slight moderation to what I said in the previous episode, one of the authors, David Weber, gave me the following feedback, which was that in the previous episode, I sort of laid these out as this happens and then that happens, whereas he said the, these last two pieces actually sort of happen together, the narrative and the network. In order for you to move down that road toward extremism, you're probably going to be exposed to two things, and the order in which you're exposed to them probably doesn't matter. In fact, you may be exposed to them at the same time. So the first one was narrative. Okay. So this was exposure to literature or philosophies that offer an explanation for why you feel humiliated. What are the forces at work in the world that caused you to feel this way? And again, could be true or not true. Could be conspiracy and how you can regain that sense of significance. So that's what they call the narrative. And usually, of course, the way to regain it is through violence. The other piece that, that's going along at this time is what they call network, which means that you make contact with a group of people who subscribe to this narrative or who may school you in this narrative. People who themselves, of course, subscribe to the narrative. And to them, violence is a perfectly acceptable, justifiable way for individuals who have undergone what you've undergone to make things right. Now, I do have an example of this, a real life example. It comes from an article that one of the authors was interviewed for. That would be the lead author, Ari Kruglansky. He commented on an article that appeared in NPR.org. It's called How a Danish Town Helped Young Muslims Turn Away from ISIS. And this came out in July of 2016, and I will definitely have a link to the article. A very interesting article written by Hannah Rosen. So she talks about what the police in a small Danish town called Aarhus, I hope I pronounced that correctly. Let's see, it's spelled A-A-R-H-U-S. So the article discusses what they are doing, apparently quite successfully, to deal with the number of citizens in their town 
that have left to join ISIS. And one of their examples was a young man named Jamal who was born in Somalia and his family moved to Denmark. So a little bit of the article here. They describe that, quote, one day in high school, Jamal's teacher organized a debate about Islam. Jamal had been on the Hajj, the pilgrimage to Mecca with his family, and he was infused with a newfound religious identity. Now, during the debate, one of the girls started saying to the class that Muslims terrorize the West and kill people and stone women. Jamal argued with her and eventually lost his temper and said, people like you should never exist. Now, at that moment, I'm still quoting here, Jamal's life went off the rails. The teacher told the principal, who told the police, who questioned Jamal about being a terrorist. Jamal had to stay home from school and miss final exams. The police cleared him, but it was too late for him to redo his exams, so he had to redo some of high school. He was furious about it, and soon after the investigation, his mother died, and he blamed her death on the stress caused by the investigation. He began to feel rejected by the West. So this is a, an example of what the researchers would refer to as a triggering event that led him to feel a loss of significance. Now, the next two components, network and narrative. So continuing with this example from this article on NPR.org, these two components are right here in this article. So continuing the quote, During that year, Jamal ran into a group of fellow Muslims who had experienced some of the same discrimination. One of them had an apartment, and the group spent a lot of time talking, praying. The friends talked a lot about jihad and making a trip to Syria. Two of the guys in the apartment began planning their trip. So this is the network that Jamal has gotten involved with. Okay, now let me come back to that story, because what I want to turn to next is, okay, you've got someone in that situation. What are we going to do? How are we going to help them get out of it? And that's what the last part of this article talks about. Okay, what are we doing for people who are feeling a, a loss of significance? Well, quote from one of the articles here. Uh, rehabilitation centers offer programs designed to address deficits in significance, either through psychological counseling or religious practice, or they provide skills that could be parlayed into significance-affording jobs or careers. And that's kind of what they're doing in this small town called Aarhus, in Denmark. What they're doing has been characterized by some as hug a terrorist, but they're doing somewhat of the opposite of what you might expect. What do you do when you find someone who has been radicalized? Do you put that person in jail? We, we typically knee-jerk to punishment approaches, but here's what they're doing in this small town. So Jamal got a call from one of the officers of the town, whose name was Thorleaf, last name Link. Now, if you're called by the police, you're probably expecting them to threaten you with jail time. But, and here I'll quote, Jamal got a call from Link, who had heard about his case. So during this call, Jamal cursed him out and tried to hang up the phone. But then Link did something Jamal didn't expect. He apologized for the ordeal his fellow officers had put Jamal through. Hearing a policeman take responsibility for his life getting derailed really moved Jamal. He agreed to come to Link's office. Continuing the quote, When Jamal got there, Link introduced him to Erhan Kilik, one of the first official mentors hired by this program they have in town to deal with these young men who are being radicalized. Kilik, K-I-L-I-C, hopefully pronouncing that correctly, was a fellow Muslim who had also faced discrimination in Denmark as a child. But he had taken a very different path. He had decided to embrace Denmark as his country. He now has a wife and two daughters and a successful practice as a lawyer. Kilik relayed to Jamal the main message of this program, and if he chose to, Jamal could find his place in Denmark. This article introduces another term, which I think is really neat, non-complementary behavior. And they mention that associate professor of psychology at Michigan State University, researcher named Christopher Hopwood, who studies non-complementary behavior. In other words, doing the opposite. You've probably done this or heard about this. Somebody comes at you in a friendly way, you'll probably re return the friendliness. If somebody comes at you very mean, you probably respond with anger. But the way to diffuse a situation 
is to do the opposite of what the other person is doing. Okay, that's why it's called non-complementary. It doesn't complement what they're doing. So helping these young men find significance and a future is going to be more effective than putting them in jail. So a little more quote here. The Danish police officers took a different approach. They made it clear to citizens of Denmark who had traveled to Syria, potentially to become extremists, that they were welcome to come home. And that when they did, they would receive help with going back to school, finding an apartment, meeting with a psychiatrist or a mentor, or whatever they needed to fully integrate back into society. It's the opposite of what we might think to do. Okay, so that addresses the loss of significance. What do we do if an individual has become exposed to an extremist network or narrative? Well, obviously, if we can prevent them from being exposed to such narratives, that would be a way to go. But of course, in our day and age with the internet, uh, you can be exposed to all kinds of undesirable things. The article talks about finding ways to disrupt, quote, the social ties that connect a person to radical others. Some radicalized individuals return on their own. The, you know, when they first hear about the, the philosophy and become influenced by the network to adopt a different lifestyle, move to a different world, it sounds great. It has an initial answer to their significance loss problem. But when they get there, it turns out to not be what they thought. They remove themselves from those networks. Another thing we need to do to help such individuals is, quote, strengthen ties to non-radical social networks. So getting you involved back with family ties or other non-extremist social networks. Quote, it would seem important to break the radical social networks by separating the hardcore leaders likely to be strongly committed to the radical narrative from the followers, the foot soldiers, who may be easier to de-radicalize. Counter-radicalization initiatives can promote social inclusion or community outreach programs, such as implemented in the Danish city of Aarhus, which connect struggling youth at risk of felt insignificance to social organizations that promote nonviolent significance-affording activities. That's an interesting quote there. Significance-affording activities. Final piece of the quote. In short, communities may use the network component of our model to create their own grassroots anti-violence movements. Sometimes it may take a network to fight a network. Really interesting quote there. Those are the things that I wanted to cover in this episode. What I have on the website is a flowchart. I typically write the notes out. Sometimes I'll put them into some sort of a concept map. And so I do have that if you're interested in just seeing uh, visual representation of this model and in which I also extracted some of these quotes. I think you'll find this really, really interesting. So come to the website, www.thepsychfiles.com, and uh, you'll find it there. And you can feel free to download it, take a look at it, and of course, citations for the research that I discussed today. Really important stuff if we want to understand both radical extremists and school shootings. So I'd love to hear your feedback on this as always. You can uh, come to the website and leave a comment on this episode 303. Uh, join the Facebook group or send me a tweet. All of those are available, all those connections on the website, www.thepsychfiles.com. Okay, thanks so much, everybody, and see you in the next episode. Take care. One last thing. Remember to check out my memory course. You can use these strategies to get better grades on your tests, to remember people's names, and even help you to remember those jokes you keep forgetting. So you will be amazed. Avid.fm slash memory master. That's avid, A-V-I-D dot F-M slash memory master. Thanks.